Uh, there are a couple faces here I don't recognize. Hello, I'm Sarah. I'm the foster coordinator here at VCAS. Um, we are sort of blessed with a unique opportunity where our shelter is selected as one of seven throughout the country to participate in a study regarding foster care of medium and large breed dogs, how it affects their length of stay, their behavior, um, morale of staff and volunteers. And as part of that, we are blessed to have um, Kelly Dewar here from Maddie's Fund. Uh, she has a, I don't even know if I said your last name right. You did? Okay. Oh, yeah. Um, her background is in marketing and media with shelters, um, as well as some additional things. And so we're able to hear her expertise on the subject, and hopefully everybody learns something. And let's give her a warm okay. Yes. Um, I um, will first kind of go into a little bit about how I ended up here. Um, like many of you, I am a shelter volunteer. I started at the Fairfax County Animal Shelter in 2013 when a life-saving director and her team came on board. I started basically like the minute they were unpacking the boxes and kind of wearing ropes and we also adopted a um, pit bull type dog puppy from the shelter at the same time. He is awesome. He's super like affectionate and just he's great with kids, great with other dogs, super reactive. <laughs> Um, and high energy and um, we learned I learned a lot from him um, about dogs and dog behavior and taking him to classes and working with the reactivity um, so when I started at the shelter I go in you know and on the first day uh, I started taking dogs out you know and I'd see this one dog who was sitting in the kennel and just like vibrating with energy just like bouncing off the walls and I would think man he's so much like good guys he's I love him, you know, I just, um, that energy. Um, and so I would take him out and I would take a little extra time with him in the play yard and try and get some of the energy out, get him out of the kennel a little bit. And um, then the next week I would come in and go right for that dog and make sure he got out, in, you know, enough time. And um, the next week I'd come in and do the same thing. And then the week after that I'd come in and he would be dead. And it hit me that there was something very wrong with what was happening. Um, that a dog who has high energy due to shelter stress is dying. Um, so this is the way it kind of plays out in shelters across the country just about every, well, every single day. Um, a dog comes in the shelter. She's really adorable, the volunteers fall in love with her. She's wiggly and sweet. And um, so people really just start to like her. And maybe she's like a little bit anxious and that just makes everybody really kind of fall in love with her a little bit more. And um, she does fine in the, initially. Um, about maybe a couple weeks or months into her stay at the shelter, you start to see a little bit of a change in behavior. You start to see her jumping up at the door, you know, when people walk by, you start to see, um, her barking at the other dogs. She becomes a little more difficult to handle. She's pulling on the leash. She's jumping and that kind of progresses to um, jumping up and biting on the leash, spinning around in the kennel endlessly, jumping six feet in the air over and over and over. And people start to talk, you know, volunteers are, you know, talking to each other. Hey, you know, I had a hard time with her today. You know, I hope she's gonna be okay. Um, you know, kind of trying to figure out how to you know, work with her. Um, she becomes really difficult to handle, and then one day, accidentally, she hit somebody when biting at the leash, and ends up in quarantine, which means 10 days of not being able to be taken out by any of the volunteers, um, a lot less um, uh, things to look at, um, things to do in there, uh, and she, when she comes out, she's 100 times worse. And the staff is faced with a conundrum. They can't put her back on the floor because she's already had a bite and she's so difficult to handle that nobody can take her out. On the other hand, they know she's not dangerous. And, you know, this is a situation that happens all the time. Um, from a situation that 
you know, in shelters, this is kind of, we, we kind of put them in this situation. Um, so I came at it from seeing this play out um, a whole bunch of times. And when the uh, director and her deputy started a short-term foster program, I was the first to sign up. I said, who do you want me to take home? I'll take anybody. And she said, I want you to take Mocha. And I had heard about Mocha. She was really difficult to get out of the kennel. She was jumpy and mouthy. She'd been there for seven months, and she had a ton of energy. Um, we took her home. We, um, I walked her until my feet fell off. <laughs> um, and we had her for the weekend. We took pictures. Um, and then uh, another foster took her for a few days. She was adopted less than a week later. Um, and a completely normal dog outside of the shelter. <coughs> Um, so, this is about marketing, but I kind of wanted to go into the shelter stress thing because it all kind of goes hand in hand. Um, so, Nani, this is, um, Nani had been in the, um, we, we've seen this in Fairfax a lot, where a dog gets out of the shelter we get great marketing material on them because there are pictures, there are stories about what they've done. It goes up on social media and people respond to it immediately. Um, and so we know this happens in Fairfax. I went to Louisville about a month ago and um, there was a dog there who'd been there for about over 200 days. She was a custody case, so she hadn't been able to get out of the shelter at all. Um, and she was also a dog who they had suspected the owner of um, dog fighting. So there was kind of a stigma there and the shelter was not really sure what they were going to do with her. And I said, why don't you let me take her home overnight and see what you know she's like. Um, so I did. She was a dog who was shut down in the kennel. She didn't, she laid in the bed, didn't, like if you came up to the door, she would just look at you. She wouldn't even get up. Um, and this is her, uh, basically the minute we walked into the hotel room. <laughs> <laughs> just joyful. The whole time she just exuded this the absolute joy. She's so cute. Isn't she? <laughs> so she um I put up a um thing on um on the, the Facebook page of the shelter, of the um, volunteer foster Facebook page, and I posted the video. Uh, somebody else decided to take her out about four or five days later, they adopted her. So, um, so that's her in her home. Um, but this is the, you know, the power of short-term foster and volunteers and, and, and fosters collecting and <coughs> creating material for social media. Um, Alright, so this presentation was originally designed for our foster apprenticeship. So it's um, pretty foster based, but it kind of can be applied just about anywhere. Um, and um, so there are um, There are some issues, you know, with, with marketing. You have your shelter. Um, oh, first of all, shelter stress. This is my own personal, like, this is not scientific whatsoever. But, like, things that help shelter, easing shelter stress. You know, you've got your getting off the shelter, in kennel enrichment, pack walks, play group, getting out of the shelter for a few hours, getting out of the shelter for the day, short term overnight foster, getting out of the shelter for good. Maybe some of those could be switched a little bit, but. Getting out of the shelter for even a tiny period of time can help a dog, the shelter stress go down. In Fairfax, we, um, when we have a dog who has shelter stress, we often send them to foster for a week and it really lowers that anxiety and when they come back, they kind of, it's kind of like reset. They may not last as long and before they need foster again, but they, um, are better on the adoption floor, they look more like a dog that somebody would want to adopt as opposed to a dog who's jumping and 
um, being difficult. So you've got a limited number of shelter staff and hundreds of dogs. And your shelter staff are doing social media and they're doing like a thousand other jobs for each person. Think personally, when I think of a social, when I write a social media post, it takes me at least an hour <laughs> to come up with a theme and to go, you know. And when you're a, on the shelter staff, you don't have time for that. Um, and so you've got all of these animals who need to be, you know, featured on social media so that people know about them. Um, so what do you do? Um, your options are limited in the shelter. You have limited backgrounds, you know, like you don't have like flower backgrounds or, you know, different places to put them, really. I mean, other than inside and outside. Um, your situations. And then stress. It makes make getting pictures tough because animals generally look stressed because they are. Um, it's tough to get to know a pet's, um, their strengths and cute quirks because a lot of them don't show up when they're stressed. Um, so you do, it, it, there is, um, you know, it can be difficult for in the shelter environment to get, you know, a lot of social media ideas and be able to put them up as much. This is why we need volunteers and fosters. Traditional marketing, um, and this is due to time and everything. The, you know, some shelters that put up the same picture over and over, which is difficult because people don't want to share the same picture over and over. Um, things like um, no dogs and no children um, are basically stop signs, even to people who have no dogs and no other children. They say, well, wait, what's wrong with this dog? Maybe it, if it's gonna bite kids, it's gonna bite me. Um, and then, you know, a lot of times because, again, due to time, it's difficult to post, they kind of rehash the same information sometimes. And um, it's, you know, um, this is why, again, we need you guys. So I'm not going to go over traditional marketing, but um, life-saving marketing, thoughtful rule breaking. I don't know if any of you have ever heard that um, thing, only one to two posts per day. You know, no more than two posts per day. No way. You can post as much as you want, as long as the content is great. Austin Animal Center posts every two hours without fail uh, during the, the day at the shelter. When they have a crisis, they post <coughs> once an hour. Um, they have a huge population. They need to get animals out the door, um, and they have a great you know amount of support. So posting often is excellent as long as the content is also excellent. You don't need to post just bios. You can post a specific pet's adorable quirk, a scene or a story about their day, um, you know, any little thing. Once um, <laughs> there was a we had a dog at Fairfax who did not want to come back inside. And when I tried to bring him back in, he hid under the bench, and he was like sitting under there. He was like a 90 pound pit bull, hiding. <laughs> <laughs> and so I just like quickly wrote up a thing that was like, um, you know, a fake conversation between me and Bruce about going back inside. And it was, it was like funny, but like it got, and then they just posted it right on the page, on the main page, and it got so many shares, but it was like a dog doing, it's all in spin too, you know? Yeah. It was a dog doing something that we, generally don't like, <laughs> um, but spun in the right way, it worked. Um, and it wasn't a biography, it was just kind of a, and, and somebody saw it and they were like, poor dog, he doesn't want to go back in a kennel, and they came and got it. Um, community creating language, I'll go over that in a little bit. And then only posts relevant to your agency. Um, it, if you have the opportunity to create a post, you know, um, definitely create that post about one of your animals or something that's relevant to your agency because people are on your page to see your animals and um, learn more about your agency. All right, so when you're doing social media uh, for animal shelters, your goals are obviously to find an adopter or a foster for the animal. But you have some kind of um, other goals. Make your foster or your shelter dog a local celebrity. And this is done um, by posting regularly on that dog. So if say there's someone who loves a certain dog and you want to create marketing material to get that dog adopted and you create some great stuff, the shelter can post it maybe every seven to ten days or so. And 
if it's great content, people are going to notice it. They're going to start forming an, an emotional attachment to that animal. And they're going to follow it. Um, and it works. I've, we've seen it happen in Fairfax um, over and over, and uh, we're starting to see it in, in different communities as well who have been doing this. It, um, we had, I had a foster called Me Sweet Jane, and she, we had her for eight months. And every family on earth who had children called us and wanted to adopt her. And I was not going to put her in a family with children. So we, you know, we kept marketing her. Um, and we weren't putting in the stop signs, and every time somebody would write in, I would say, hey, you know, she might not fit your great fit, but here are three dogs who are. Um, so anyway, after a couple of months, we, she started getting noticed on the street. I'd be walking her, and somebody would call up and be like, is that sweet Jane? And I'd be like, how do you, you know, we follow your page. We know who she is. Um, and it happens often um, when people really do form that connection. And also create emotional connections, and that's, kind of the, um, basically what you're looking for in social media, some way for people to make an emotional connection with an animal. So this is a mock-up um, of a guy who, um, and actually this did happen in Fairfax, where a UPS driver knew, noticed um, <coughs> a dog who had been on the Facebook page and met him, and so they decided to take a picture and put it on social media, and people loved it. Um, they were like, you know, uh, French fries of great the celebrity. And the person who was in the picture, of course, followed it. And she commented and her friends commented. So it really, you know, um, it was pretty self. Um. So this is um, Ghost. And she was at the shelter, the Fairfax County Animal Shelter, a couple of years ago. She was a pit bull type dog. And she was deaf. And she was also severely shelter stressed. She was so shelter stressed that. When um, one, one of the volunteers was taking her out, who knows why she was wearing diamond earrings. Ghost jumped up, grabbed one, and swallowed it. Uh -oh. She got it back. <laughs> <laughs> a couple days later. But they, they, they did a ton of posting on Ghost to try to get her out of it because she was so stressed they really wanted to get her out of the shelter you know, quickly. People were doing a lot of um, outings and um, as you can see here, this one got you know <laughs> quite a bit of um, interest on uh, social media, and this potential adopter says, "Look, she's so amazing." Here's the next one. When she went into, they they were able to find a foster home, and um, so the foster sent in pictures, and it was this. Uh, they live on a farm, and um, so it just showed her with the farm animals. And then here's another one of her learning how to play soccer. All three of these are volunteer, are volunteer and foster driven marketing. This isn't stuff the staff had to create. This is stuff that people exactly like you guys took pictures of, did a little write up on, put it on your um, volunteer and foster Facebook pages. And the staff, all they had to do was, you know, save it and then, you know, cut and paste the text and put it up there. It was easy and it was cute. This picture you may notice from, um, Ventura uh, County Animal Services page. We, we sent that to them um, when we were uh, doing the foster posting. All right, so obviously she got adopted, Aww. but notice something toward the bottom there. This person who'd been following her since the beginning adopted her. Wow. And um, this is actually a friend of mine. She's, she's incredible. Um, but the um, this has happened a lot in Fairfax, where people have been following along. We had another dog who um, was stressed. We um, people had been doing outings with him so that we could get him out of the shelter and kind of keep that stress level under control. The foster coordinator wasn't able to find a long-term foster, so volunteers kind of got together and were like, "All right, look, I can take him on Wednesday if you take him on Thursday, and so and so can take him over the weekend." So we were able to keep him out of the shelter as much as possible until we were able to find a long-term foster. Um, while at the same time, marketing the crap out of him. <laughs> um, and what happened in the end was he was adopted by somebody who had been following all along, but they started out in a place where they couldn't have pit bull type dogs, and they ended up moving, and then they were able to adopt him by the time, um, yeah. yeah. 
Is there anything to the thought where I, I totally love all that and the dog's out doing something, but does, do, is there anything to the thought that those images don't make the dog look as needy as a dog in a shelter? Like it's, it looks like it's, oh, it's on a farm, you know? It, like when people look at those pictures. Actually, the, the, a lot of the foster ones and the, um, they get probably more engagement than the ones in the shelter. And it's not necessarily need, it's because, well first, the animals are happy, and people like to share that, and people like to look at that. But also, there, the, there's an interest, you know, there's something different than you can always pull off in a shelter. Yeah. You know? It just um, almost makes it look like he has a happy home, in a way, you know, so you still have to keep pounding the fact that you he do. is homeless. Right, right, because you do get people saying, uh, oh, he should just stay with his foster. Right. And then you have to be like, look, you know, we only have a certain amount of fosters, and you know, uh, you know, that everybody thing. can adopt a dog. And, and, okay. Um, all right. So, the method: uh, volunteers and fosters create marketing material. If there's a particularly needy pet, hopefully it would be done every seven to ten days or so. Frequent posting, um, and that's overall, even on the on the page of the sh shelter. Uh, post new material only. Um, together, the posts tell a story. So when you have a you know foster celebrity, all of these sto all of these posts are telling the story of this dog's life, and the climax of the story obviously is the adoption. And people celebrate when they get to know a dog over social media like that. Ghost when she um, can't remember but she, her adoption post usually they get you know a handful of shares, but her adoption post got like sixty or seventy shares because everybody wanted to tell everyone that this dog finally got adopted and they were so excited about it. Um, this is Grace, and this happened earlier this month. She'd been at the shelter, she was a senior uh, pickle type dog maybe. Um, she'd been in the shelter for several, for like two months, and they'd been trying to get her adopted, and um, they kind of went with a little bit of a, like a sad start to the story. Um, you know, she had been kept in a kennel for roughly four years before arriving at the shelter. Uh, after hard work by her animal protection officers and the vet, she was awarded to the shelter. Um, she was nervous at first, and then it goes into um, how she had this wonderful day out with a volunteer. Uh, she was adopted 12 hours later. <coughs> Actually, she wasn't because the shelter closes at 7. <laughs> she was adopted less than an hour later. So, you guys have these. This is where you would be posting, you know, um, your stories and, and things. Uh, it saves time for staff. It allows the you know your shelter to collect new and unique social media content that you may not always be able to collect in the shelter. Um, and then you can and the shelter can promote animals who are not in the shelter as well because of foster they can send us. Uh, so photographs, good quality photographs, um, outdoor pictures are usually pretty um, popular, or dogs with other people and or pets, so that you can tell, you know, hey, they're good with other dogs, or um, or whatever. Uh, pets looking into the camera lens, that's really important, um, because you feel like you can you can make an emotional connection a little better when you can see into a pet's eyes. Um, and also ask a professional. You guys have um, photographers here um, who I'm sure will be willing to either meet you somewhere or have you come in and, you know, um, or if you're a foster, um, to get pictures of foster pets. Uh, this is Dakota. She, um, I had a, a friend, who, one of the photographers was a friend of mine, and she had a string yeah. to, to do a photo session. Um, and this one was taken across the street uh, at a park. And um, literally, <laughs> she said, whenever we, they put a photo up of hers, it immediately we have like people inquiring. This photo, we had, a, I think, about six people inquire about this dog because of that. Um, and also, when you do collaborate with other volunteers and um, professionals, like photographers, you get the word out about your pet a little better. We also had a dog who was highly, highly energetic, like the most energetic dog I've ever met. And I'm thinking, how are we going to get this dog a dog? We're going to have to have somebody who's like a marathon runner. And I took her, took the dog over to Jean for photos, and while I was there, Jean said, so, you know, what do you think her perfect adopter would be? And I was like, well, you know, probably somebody who, you know, runs or walks or hikes, you know, somebody really energetic, um, probably somebody who has a fence because, 
you know, she might not want to run, run around in the yard, too, because she does have a lot of energy. Uh, maybe somebody without kids. She was pretty, you know, jumpy and um, stuff. And um, I think that was, I think that was it. Well, anyway, two hours after we got, I got home, I got an email from from um, Jean, and she was like, "My neighbor would like to meet Coco. She lost her beagle um, a couple of months ago, and she's been doing her regular four mile walks every day, carrying his collar. Aww. She's a marathon runner. They had her, their kids were grown. They um, and she um, had a gigantic fence in the backyard. It was it was great." you know, example of, of networking and um, how that can help that find films. So, um, on outings, um, here's just some of the things that you want, you'll want to think about. What issues does this dog display in a shelter and is anything different outside the shelter? On day trips you may not see as much as you would on an overnight or a weekend or a, you know, week-long foster, but you will see some things. Um, I put the picture of Muggsy up here because, as you all know, he loves his Kong and it doesn't <laughs> rarely is seen without it in his mouth. Um, I took that picture because the minute we got into the hotel room and I put the Kong down, he sniffed it and walked away and forgot about it for the rest of the trip. Yeah. Um, so things like that, you know, is the dog really reactive? I, I took um, Ruby home last night and she's reactive here and when we got home, we saw a couple of dogs from far away, she didn't really even notice them. This morning we, we stopped to get the donuts and there was another dog from about here to the camera and it was like a Cocker Spaniel and she just looked at it and just like walked. She, she didn't even notice it. Um, so those kinds of things are really also important for the shelter to know. When you, um, shelters do evaluations on dogs, but since behavior is not always the same in the shelter and out of it, it's hard to predict, you know, what a dog is going to be like in a home. The more you know and the more you can tell the shelter about your experiences with dogs outside the shelter, the better that they are able to do the matching and, you know, the better that they are able to evaluate behavior. Um, what new ways does this dog reveal who, who he or she really is outside the shelter? Because you will see behaviors that you don't see here and you'll, you know, um, and generally they're going to be positive ones. <laughs> Uh, what do, do, things does this dog do that are adorable? Um, and then, like, try to think what situations you can put the dog in to get adorable photos. Or, um, like, consider the backgrounds, like if there's, a, a, you know, flowers or something, maybe they would sit near them. Uh, how can you get photos of this dog looking relaxed and happy? Like, what is it like to do, you know, and, you know. And um, how can you get them to look at the camera? Maybe a squeaky toy, maybe a treat, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, <clears throat> working in pets in foster care. I use this example because the, the look on her face is so human and she's looking directly in the camera. It's like she's looking directly into your soul. And um, when we, when I did the meme for this, I was trying, you know, I knew it needed a, a, a meme that would really get people and um, she was in foster care, and it was all about the emotional connection. Um, so those are some things for dogs in foster, well, really dogs anywhere, or cats. Uh, some examples of, we um, have a lot of fun with photography in Fairfax. Uh, I haven't done it much anymore, but we did some neat stuff. We did a photo shoot of, um, uh, my nephew in um, superhero costumes with dogs in superhero costumes and it, it was like a rousing success this video this photo was posted three hours later his dog was out the door and there were people like waiting in line for him <laughs> um, that one um, we had that adorable little girl and she they had her in like little like several different like adorable dresses with like little hats and we had pictures with kittens and cats and like guinea pigs and stuff for a um, holiday delivery um, event. And then also cats with props, um, just for fun. <laughs> so video, um, you'll want to take it horizontally for best picture, otherwise you get those two weird black lines. Um, use quality video, obviously, and then ensure that any 
Background music is free for public use. I usually try to put the music on in YouTube. It can be kind of hard to find something that's not like kind of cheesy in YouTube. But <laughs> <laughs> but um, you, what really is the worst is when you find a great song and you put it in there and then the shelter can't use it because it's um, not free for public use, which has happened in Fairfax a couple times. So um, we do um, try to make sure that the video, the music is free. Mm. We've done some fun stuff with video. One of them, the dog, Sweet Jane. I would show it to you, but it's like this, and it's very blurry. But she, um, we found out while fostering her that she really, like, you could call anyone in the house, and she would come running. Like, she just loved to come. She just loved people so much that, like, no matter what, she was like, maybe they're calling me. <laughs> and so I, we took video of her. Uh, and I'd be like, Sweet Jane, and she'd come running. Jane, she'd come running. Doggy. She'd come running. <laughs> hey, you! She'd come running. So it was, you know, just kind of like little quirks like that. Um, you know, find ways to. Um, right, this. See if that works. Perfect. Okay. Um, kennel walkthrough videos. These in Fairfax are, have been extremely popular. Um, all the, the staff does, it takes about five minutes. They take a camera, they walk through the kennels and kind of introduce people to like maybe 10 dogs in a row. Those videos, every time they do them, they go viral. Um, and it's like, it takes nothing. I mean, it takes literally minutes. Um, also, um, Videos of cats or dogs playing, like playgroup ones, which people seem to always love. Uh, doing dog training, uh, doing uh, food puzzles and, and uh, enrichment, that kind of a thing. This one is a video of a cat. She. Oh, oh, crud. oh crud. She was um, a friend of mine who works at a shelter nearby. She had been at the shelter for three years. She was kind of a nondescript black cat. Um, nobody really knew much about her, so a friend of mine who's kind of like a cat whisperer, she had this Mary Poppins bag full of like all kinds of cat stuff, and so we went to the shelter and just tried it all out on her. Turns out this cat was just like a playing like fool. She was awesome. And um, so we came up with this video of Cantina. <laughs> And he ran out of the room, and, I, and so I put my sneakers on. I was like, "What is he doing?" And I walk out into the hall, and it's winter time. I walk out in the hall. There he is with my jacket in his mouth, and he looks at me and he goes <laughs> and shakes it at me. And I was just dumbfounded. He went into the closet, selected my coat from like 15 different coats, and then got it out. And 
I was totally dumbfounded. I posted this on the volunteer page. The shelter posted it on their main page. We had more doctors contacting the shelter than I could actually contact back. I finally was like, please, please send out some kind of mass email. I was like, I cannot contact all of these people. Um, he was awesome. He got adopted by the first person that met him. Um, he was great. Um, biographies, obviously I didn't quite finish this slide, but right in the third person, what we found in Fairfax is that when you write from the perspective of the animal, it doesn't, it hasn't gotten really the engagement that posts um, do when you write in the third person. Uh, and then also keep the stop signs out of the marketing. In your, um, in the packet there, the Animal Farm Foundation one, there is a um, graphic of a Match.com post. Uh, it's kind of a mock-up of. Any ones we don't have? <laughs> this is one with the larger block across the top. If you don't have one, let me know. Which one? This one with the block yeah. across the top. Ah. Did it not make it? It might not make it. Okay. Yeah. Ah, it didn't end up in the packet. Um, anyway, it's a Match.com post, and it's a mock-up of uh, like a person if they were if they were trying to market themselves as we try to market dogs. And it's basically like, here's a picture of me crying. Here's a picture of me after I got my first dentist tooth extracted. Um, you know, I, you know, snore in my sleep, and I tend to be emotional, and I, you know, blah blah blah. Uh, please, um, you know, I must be proposed to by 5 p.m. today. <laughs> <laughs> and you know when you look at it you're like this is ridiculous nobody would ever contact this person but it was it's mm -hmm. kind of very similar to the way we do what you know a lot of places do market dogs you guys don't hear but you know in a lot of um, a lot of places there is one in here the resume one I which like is that. the similar oh yeah where right it's, um, I haven't I've been unemployed for a year no fault of my own <laughs> um, <laughs> I post inappropriate things on the company's Facebook. <laughs> so I, it's a very similar idea. That, that one is in there. Memes are always fun. We um, did a lot of these earlier. I used to help Kristen with graphics and social media before the foster. And um, Bam Bam was a um, pitbull type dog who'd been at the shelter for a long time. He seemed to bond closer to men, so we were trying to kind of market him to men. Um, Octavia, first of all, this picture kills me. Yes. Um, she, it just, it killed, I was like, there's, there's gotta be a meme in this somewhere. She had FIV, so, and she was actually one of the first um, cats at the shelter, because it was, again, the, the, the director was new, and um, they hadn't done it this way before. Um, so we used it in a post as to, you know, here's FIV, and we're saving these cats, and that kind of thing. Uh, Pee Wee Herman was returned. And that's him coming back to the shelter and doing a post on, you know, uh, <laughs> he has no idea why he's being returned. Uh, we, we've done a ton of memes in Fairfax. If you go to the Fairfax County Animal Shelter's Facebook page, there is an album um, of memes, and it's all memes. You're welcome to steal any of them, uh, which is why we put it there. Can you say that again? Where did you uh, Fairfax County Animal Shelter. Their Facebook page, oh. they have an album uh, of memes, and we put it up there so that other shelters can steal our ideas, because nobody here has seen Need a Wingman, no. most likely. So. Uh, so this is kind of like the next level, like boosting even further the um, signal for pets. The Shelter Pet Project is a national website. You can submit pets. Anyone can submit a pet. Volunteers, community, anyone. Uh, all you need to do is send the pet, a link to the pet's online pro profile. So if you have a dog who's a long stay and you want them to feature them, you just send it to them, um, send them a link, and they will post it. If it is urgent, let them know. They can try and get it up there sooner. And they, their posts generally are shared, you know, like hundreds of times because it is national. Um, and we have gotten inquiries when we put pets up on, social, on um, the shelter pet project, even though it's national from local. Media sponsorships are, um, when I was on the board of the Friends of the Fairfax County Animal Shelter, we, um, we did a sponsorship program where people could sponsor a pet's adoption fee. And 
once that was done, one of the um, volunteers, there was a long stake out there, and she was like, well, what else can I do? And I was like, well, maybe we could boost them. Um, so we created a program where people would give us a donation of $25. We would use that money to advertise, basically, to boost a post about the pet on social media that we would target the audience, say it was a um, pitbull type dog, we would um, target it to people in the Fairfax County area who like pitbulls and parolees and um, pitbulls against mis misinformation and um, you know, uh, different you know, pitbull type things. Uh, so that it would be to a targeted audience. And what happened was the post would be shown as an ad, well it would just be in the Facebook feed and just say sponsored to thousands of people who would never otherwise have seen it, people who had never heard of our shelter, had never heard of the Friends, and it works incredibly well, especially for those pets who are hardest to adopt. Um, special needs pets, senior cats, um, that, um, the, um, and also the social media page for the Friends got, for every boosted post, we would get between 10 and 50 new likes on the page, which meant that in the future, animals would be seen by even more people. Uh, this is a this is Star. She is a 15 year old deaf black cat. So she's got like basically everything going against her. She came into the shelter and somebody sponsored her immediately because they knew she was going to be a hard sell. Three days later, this woman came and adopted her because she saw the sponsored post. Never heard of her friends ever in her life. She just it was because of the uh, sponsorship. Regularly, the Friends posts, um, back when I did this, got between about, we've got around 1,500 views. Sponsored posts would get between 10 and 25,000 views. Um, so it would then be seen by a massively wider audience than they would have otherwise. And then this is um, kind of exciting. The effect of the sponsorships on the Facebook page likes. Here's when media sponsorships started. You can see the gradient kind of goes up a little bit. But here's where 12 sponsorships were donated in one month. And you can see how the legs went up. This one is a record 33 media sponsorships were donated um, over the Christmas holidays. And it like basically went straight up. Uh, and so they really, they, it, not only does it help that one pet, it helps pets in the future. It's really kind of a win-win. Um, and um, you guys are doing it. So if there is a pet that you want to have boosted, Talk to Randy. Yeah, we just had somebody, they wanted to sponsor Max. So they they wanted to sponsor his adoption fee, 120. But he got adopted right. before we could use it. So we're going to use that money to boost another. And um, people have been calling and said, hey, I want to sponsor this dog's adoption. Well, the, it's already been sponsored. Would you Are you okay with us using the money to maybe help market? They said, yes. Yeah. So we're going to start putting that out there. And Christmas time, that's a fantastic idea. Mm -hmm. So many people yes. want to give. People love it at Christmas because they yeah. can give it as gifts. Or not even just people who want to pay it forward at the front counter. Right. And let me talk to you later about just a quick, about advertising it. Just because we have done it a few times. Okay. Um, sorry. So uh, Coco was a um, behavior dog. She was this close to being euthanized. She was super happy <coughs> mouthy in the shelter. A friend of mine said, I'll take her home, see how she is. She took her home. She did have some issues, they worked on it. She got much better. And she did a sponsored post. Somebody who, somebody, somebody saw it who never would have seen it otherwise and came and adopted her. And um, what's great is that she was in love with my, with, with the, the foster's dog. And it looked exactly like her new brother. <laughs> um, uh, also, volunteer and foster created social media pages. We have a bunch of these in Fairfax. Uh, one of the volunteers created Nova Cats, Northern Virginia Nova. Um, so she's been doing this for a couple of years. They have, a, um, and no money has been spent on it at all, at all or at least at this point. Um, they had, um, after the first two years, they'd found homes for I think 35 cats, all of them seniors with special needs. Um, just through the page by sharing cats. Uh, this is one in Austin for a specific animal. Uh, 
what's great is that all of the video and photos are in one place. So if somebody does inquire about the animal, then people can go there and they can see everything. Uh, and then also make direct contact with the people who know the dog the best. And then it can be turned over to the adopter for updates, which everybody um, on the page of uh, always loves. Oh, uh, one more thing. Washington Humane Society has an Instagram. Uh, they, they, it's I think long stay dogs at WHS. So they pick a new long stay dog, and then they, then it's their Instagram until that dog gets adopted, and then they pick a new one. Mm -hmm. So you're always, you know, they always have a, a dog on that page. And he's, this is um, Noah Pets Alive sending them home. This is kind of when I left the friends and we started Noah Pets Alive. We kind of started a hybrid between Shelter Pet Project and um, media sponsorships. So um, people can donate media sponsorships to boost a pet anywhere in the country. Obviously, you guys don't need it, but um, other shelters who um, don't have sponsorship programs can do it that way. Uh, do's and don'ts. Inconsistent posting um, takes forever sometimes to come up with posts. Uh, sometimes people will post, you know, one and then they won't post again for a week. Um, you really need that uh, continual uh, posting to keep people interested. Multiple posts at once. It's not terrible. I mean, you can post, you know, several posts right together, but you may you know, the posts may not be seen as much as they would if you spread them out. So scheduling um, works. Although it can be difficult because if the dog, you know, you just kind of have to keep in mind. So and so is going up tomorrow at three, and if they get adopted, uh, including the pet's shelter ID number, um, just because it kind of breath, kind of makes you feel like that pet is just a number. It's not. It's not so personal. Uh, Austin Animal Center has a great workaround because they have a million dogs, and they. Um, a lot of them have the same name. So instead of posting the ID number, they say, come meet her, she's in Kennel 408. Uh, posting on social media without a video visual. Uh, people do this a lot when they have the information they want to put out. But what you really are missing when you do that is you're missing an opportunity to market a pet. So working a pet into every post is really important. We, um, this one is about a closing for Labor Day, and then instead we write, Moki's really excited to be spending extra time in the care of one of our weekend foster families while we're closed for Labor Day. Come out and meet him, you know, come on in when the shelter reopens Tuesday at 11 and ask him about his weekend shelter break. So just working those pets into every, you know, post that you have. A lot of times in Fairfax, when we do events, we'll, you know, make up flyers for the event. We will try to include available animals so that we can also talk about them during the posting as well. Other platforms, oh, this is not other platforms. This is the, um, <laughs> this dog had the biggest ears I've ever seen. Oh, but very large, but. <laughs> this is just about community creating language. Um, this is the way this is kind of long stay SPCA would like to invite its supporters for its half off event, you know, adoption event, ha Halloween. So when you read, would like to invent, invite its supporters, it makes you kind of feel like, well, am I not a supporter? It makes you feel a little bit left out. Even though it's inviting you, it's kind of not inviting you. Um, better way to do it is you're invited to our Halloween event. Talk to your audience like you are friends and that you're a community and that you all know each other. And, um, talk to them as though you really value their you know, input and want them to be there. So you, um, we, us, that kind of a thing. You don't want to refer to your organization as third person. Um, uh, just a couple of things. Promote your social media across platforms, you know, on Twitter, Talk about your Facebook page. You, you know, follow us on Facebook too. Um, that kind of thing. Link to your profiles wherever you can, like in the bottoms of your emails, and um, a lot of other stuff. We've uh, Instagram. I have a 
friend who is an Instagram guru, she, her dog has like 20,000 Instagram followers. And I asked her for some tips about how she did it. Uh, look, she said, look for a group similar to yours in mission and location and follow their followers because you know they're already interested in groups like yours. Uh, find out the hashtags that your target audience uses and use them. Also use the most popular hashtags because people look them up all the time. Uh, do contests and then ask questions in the body of your posts. Twitter, uh, including images with your tweets, it's uh, been studied that that increases the engagement. And then uh, you can schedule posts using Hootsuite and Sprout Social. Other places to market shelter pets, Craigslist, Nextdoor, Patch, Flyers, Tumblr, Reddit, Inger, and on and on. Uh, I put this picture here because a um, this dog uh, was a Louisville dog. They, um, he, it was a long stay dog. He had he had something on his record that made it like harder to find an adopter. Um, he was his adopter found him on Craigslist like two days ago. So. Um, yeah. And actually it turned out to be have been her dog, but he got away like years and years ago. And they refound him. Like <laughs> so hold on a second. Um, a couple of things that one thing that I forgot to mention. Uh, Kristen Auerbach, who is the deputy director at Austin Animal Center and who I um, basically learned everything I know from, she has a couple of things that she always says. One of them is, if you do something that works, awesome, don't ever do it again. People yeah. get bored really fast. Always try new things, and that's what also makes it difficult about social media and shelters. This is why you guys are really needed, because thinking of those new ideas all the time takes a lot of time. Um, also, what was the other one? Oh, people really like to see behind the scenes. They like to feel like they can go behind the scenes and see what's going on you know, um, what, how, the, how you know, the inner workings. Uh, Fairfax, we have, every once in a while, someone will get a great shot of a, you know, caretaker or a staff member just, like, loving on a dog. We had this one dog who was terrified in her kennel, and one of the staff members just fell in love with him, with her, and he laid a blanket down and just went in there and, like, laid with her and cuddled for, like, an hour one day. And the staff went in and took a picture of it, put it on social media, and it went completely viral. Mm -hmm. People love to see that kind of thing. All right, so I'm issuing you guys a challenge. We have some long-stay dogs here, and what the goal is to get the longest 20 dogs out the door. And I think we definitely can do this. Uh, I'm going to make a list um, with Sarah's help of the long-stay dogs and what kennels they're in. And um, you guys have two months. Uh, what I would like to see is uh, create as much marketing material on these dogs as possible. Post them on the pages. You can do it in the shelter, but um, definitely please try to take these dogs on as many hot outings as possible and get pictures. Grab a friend, have them take the pictures while you handle the dog or vice versa. Um, get them out of the shelter as much as possible and get great marketing material and you will see animals get adopted. Uh, I have some prizes, $25 for, to a pet store for the volunteer who goes on the most hot outings in the next few months, and then two $10 tickets for the first two volunteers that uh, create marketing material that actually gets a pet adopted. And it will happen, and it's addictive. <laughs> and that's it. You guys have any questions? Is there any kind of word count guideline? I mean, I know you want to make a clever story because some of the ones with a lot of content were the ones that worked. Right. It's very difficult. <laughs> right. It's, you know, it, there isn't really. Um, try for short. But some it's people don't want to keep reading, but then dog lovers or whatever might be like, ah. Right. If it's, if it's emotionally engaging content, it really doesn't long, ma matter how long it is. Okay. As long as you grip them in the first two sentences. That's kind of um, a lot of the, that's kind of a, the important part probably. Did I miss anything, Sarah? I don't think so. Um. Okay. Well, I don't think so. Well, thank you guys. What
Oh, I was just going to say, what were some of the questions from the earlier ones? Yeah, Any, like, like, good ones? Mm-hmm. I know, I saw like you guys, like, questions. disgusting. <laughs> yeah. Disgusting. disgusting. <laughs> there was questions about, um, we had some people here that run the Callaway Cat public page. They're trying very hard to build up their um, followers. So there was questions of, you know, um, how often should we post? And should we share other people's material? Or should we just constantly be coming up with our own? Um, do videos that are being produced and edited with music and slides, are those right. more or less viral than kind of off the cuff, I just sort of caught this on video? Um, and we had, we had talked before about um, like videos that you do don't have to be like choreographed. If it's just like your iPhone in a cat kennel for like 10 seconds, that could be like 10 times better than like if I were to go on the computer and like splice it together with words and, and you know, yeah, the emotional it, content is really exactly important. I think most of the questions everything came back to are you creating material that has an emotional connection does it present a feeling immediately versus um, you know it's overproduced or it's it's super well structured you know is it those things aren't aren't as important in social media land as they are in like reports for an office, right? So it's more, um, does this picture speak to you? Does this picture grab your attention? Does this, is this video interesting? Are the first, the first line of this post, is it interesting? Does it make me want to read more? Does it make me feel something? Versus there, this is exactly what works. You know, it's, it, the, the internet's a fickle place mm -hmm. and you never know what will and will catch people's attention. Um, but if you have emotion and if you can can make somebody feel something, it's going to have more meaning and more um, views than kind of the calculated, planned out, structured post yeah. or video. I'm really glad to hear that because that's kind of the way that I like to write. For those that don't Criticize know, Jane's, a little bit more Jane's our rescue coordinator. She oh. writes beautiful, amazing posts. She does. Very, very thoughtful, that, that's what grabs me when I go to a Facebook page. And I'm a writer by trade. Not anymore. It hasn't been a big year. So, yeah, I'm glad to hear that. And then also, um, something that I was going to ask on a main Facebook page, on a shelter Facebook page, Something that when I go to Facebook pages for organizations, not just shelters, that kind of turns me off is a bunch of like, uh, here's an event happening this day, and then there's something, it almost starts to look like a bunch of ads, and it turns me off. Because emotional content is not there. Yeah. You do have, you have to make something else for a thrift store that's contributing, and then there's something else, and it just kind of you're like, okay, where's the stuff? Where's the right. where's the beef, you know? Right, yeah, yeah. yeah. You do, and I, I, um, you have to mix it up, and, and, you know, emotional content is really important, and spacing out those events and, you know, um, raffles and things like that in between posts on animals that are engaging is, is important. I actually have a question now. Um, mm -hmm. On one of the slides, you had two different pictures of the dog, mm -hmm. where um, the dog looks completely different in the second picture from what they did in the first. How how do you make um, how do you spin that into something that's really going to grab somebody's heartstrings? Oh, that was the picture where the dog had the missing fur. It was like pinkish, and then the one next to it with oh, the fur right. grown in. I think was oh, that the one. Oh, oh yes. yeah. The before and after is like it's it's gripping. Um, really, any before and after when you have a dog who um, who looks like that. Yeah. Um, always, if you guys have mange, mange dogs with mange um, or anything like that, take a before picture, and when they you know are are healed. Taken after, people love this. Yeah, this is like a recipe for success. The reason why I asked that is, I think back in October, we we had a dog come in that had his hair was just all disgusting and gross. He had mange or, or something, and he's out of foster now. Mm -hmm. But now he looks like a completely different dog. Right. And what's great about that is 
people love to see that and they love your organization for it. Yeah. They, they think you guys are saving lives, look what you did for this dog. Um, so yeah. it's really good all around. It's you know great for community engagement and everything. Awesome. That's it. Sorry, I was going to tell you this. The study, you guys are like totally winning. You are winning. You guys are winning. <laughs> you guys, I mean, you guys have more dogs in the study than any other shelter. And I just, I really enjoyed being here. I love the energy that everybody has. And I love the sense of community that I get from your staff and volunteers, which is part of the reason I felt like the challenge might actually work because. You guys really have kind of a, you know each other, you, you know, um, pull together, and I really um, I think it's awesome. So.